Bruchem Aboim. Thank you very much. Welcome to our house. And a happy Cholomoy Sukkot to uh, all that are listening. Um, last week we began with a uh, thought on a time of joy. And again, this will be a continuation, again, since we are in the middle of the holiday, the festival of Sukkot, and uh, the Shemini Atzeret with Simchas Torah, again, one of the happiest times of the year. So, there's no festival that's as rich in mitzvot as is Sukkot. It contains the Torah commandment of, again, the Sukkah, the hut that we stay in, the four species, the Lulav and Esrig, it also contains the mitzvah of the water libation in the Nisach Hamayim, which is what we call Halacha Moshe Misenai, which translates to mean that it was a law that was given orally to Moshe. It was not written down openly in the Torah. In addition, there is the commandment, the mitzvah of holding the Arava, the willow on Hoshana Rabbah, a custom of, again, prophetic origin. There is also the specific commandment to rejoice which was mentioned earlier. So what we have is seven mitzvot, a number that is always connected to the world in general. God created the world in seven days. Uh, now, why would these commandments be connected to joy? Answer, they are all connected to unity and humility, two traits that are very precious in the eyes of God. The sukkah is a mitzvah which is unusual, unusual in that we enter into the mitzvah with our whole body. We enter with family, guests, and hopefully the poor and lonely. In fact, it says that at the time of the coming of the Messiah, we will all gather into one large sukkah. Now, the sukkah is a temporary dwelling. After the harvest, one might feel a sense of arrogance, superiority. He now has gathered in all of his produce, and now he sees the success of all of his toil. This may give him a feeling of pride. So God says to us, in order to counteract any such feelings, leave your comfortable house and move into a simple hut. Know that it's not one's possessions that makes one happy, but rather his connection to his Father in heaven and serving him. God has commanded us to enclose ourselves with our family and all of our guests, both those that are physical and spiritual, in an atmosphere of love and camaraderie. Now, if you're wondering what I meant by spiritual guest, it wasn't an accident. There is a belief that on all seven days of the holiday of Sukkot, there are seven guests that visit our Sukkot. They are called the Ushbizim. They are Abraham, Yitzchak, Abraham, Isaac, Yaakov, Jacob, Yosef, Moshe, Aaron, and David, King David. One of them presides on each one of the seven days with the other six in attendance. First night, Abraham, Abraham presides, he is taught the second night, and so on. Now, they also represent the seven emotional traits that God has taken upon himself in the creation of the world. They are kindness, severity, truth or beauty, victory, splendor, foundation, and kingship. Hasidus also believes that the Rebbe is beginning with the Holy Baal Shem Tov through the previous Rebbe also visit those Sukkot that wait for their presence. Now, though they may attend, only special and unique individuals have truly merited to see their presence. There are many th things around us in this world, like atoms, bacteria, and viruses, that we really do not see with our physical eye, yet we know they do exist. Scientists and researchers who have the proper equipment have the ability to see them. And so, too, in a spiritual way, if one has enough belief, his inner spiritual eye has the ability to see wonders. Our physical eye is limited, uh, but our spiritual or godly eye is a connection to the infinite. All things connected to this holiday, people, unity, and joy, commemorate the return of the clouds of glory after an absence of three months. And as I mentioned before, the mon, the heavenly food, fell in the desert at the merit of Moshe, the well, the sea of water that followed them through their 40-year journey in the desert came in the merit of Miriam. Both the mun and the well are really essentials of life, something that a loving, loving father could never take away from a child under any circumstance. But the clouds of glory, 
that came in the merit of Aaron, they were a luxury. The clouds made their travels in the desert much more pleasant. And without the clouds, they would have to bear the blazing sun during the day and the freezing cold during the night. The sand would blow into their eyes and their mouths. Everything that they owned was covered in sand. This may well have been God's plan all along. They initially may not have seen the clouds really as such a gift. But after three months of living with the elements, the heat, the cold, the sand, the return of the clouds <laughs> must have been a true sense of paradise. Once the clouds returned, they no longer had to eat dust. There were clouds on all four sides. In addition to the cloud that was under their feet that carried them, they didn't even have to walk. They no longer suffered from the heat during the day, nor the cold during the night. As an added bonus, all the Torah laws concerning agriculture did not take effect until the nation took possession of the land of Canaan. Now this is important, because wherever they camped, they had water, earth, and a sealed environment. Things began to grow. So, as you can imagine, in reality, it was a bit of paradise the Garden of Eden. If the laws of agriculture would have been followed, they would not have been able to enjoy all of God's blessings. Now we see that the number seven connected to the holiday again and again. The holiday is celebrated initially in seventh month. It is celebrated for seven days. It celebrates the ingathering of the harvest, which connects the seven types of produce that Israel is known for. Dates, Figs, pomegranates, olives, again with oil, grapes, wine, wheat, and barley. We welcome the Ushbazin, the seven illustrious guests, and we pour the water libation in Nisal Hamayim for all seven days. All these sevens lead us to the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret, a very special day. Eight is a number that signifies something that transcends the limitations of this world, much like a circumcision. On this day, there is only one ox that is brought as a sacrifice, in contrast to the 70 oxen that were brought for the nations during the seven previous days. Whereas the first seven days were shared with all the inhabitants of the world, the eighth day, this day, is a private day. It is a day where our father, our king, can, so to speak, take off his crown. He can put aside all the pomp and protocol and just be a father. His wish, like that of any loving father, is just to spend a private day with his beloved child. As Rashi states in the book of Numbers in the portion of Pinchas, that a father would say to his child, you know, your departure is difficult for me, please, just stay for another day. We find a similarity between the Musaf sacrifices, the additional sacrifice of Shemini Atzeris, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. They all consisted of only one ox, one ram, and seven sheep. From this, our sages tell us that Shemini Atzeret also shares the theme of atonement. It is called the final sealing for the days of the year. You know, I, I find it interesting. There are many opinions as to what really ends the days of repentance. The final sealing. I saw one opinion that said it went all the way to Hanukkah. So what I take away from all these opinions is that God is a benevolent father. And so he threatens, <laughs> like all fathers do. And this is your final warning. And the next time he says, now this time I I'm really serious. Always trying to help the child repent and do better. Punishment? Punishment is a last resort. All the seven misses of the day connect to joy. I mentioned that the sukkah where we come together as one body. The midst of Lul of an Esri symbolizes our connection to all Jews, regardless of their spiritual level. There are approximately 391,000 plant species known to science. Yet God has chosen only four plants. The Esri, a citron, a Lulav, a branch of a palm tree, a Hadas, a myrtle, and an Arava, a willow, to represent the theme of Sukkot. But why? Why these? These four species can be connected to four types of Jews and four types of parts of the body. 
The Esrit has taste and fragrance. This can allude to those Jews who possess both Torah and good deeds. The sage, the Talmud Chacham. The Lulu, the branches of a palm tree, have taste but no fragrance. And this alludes to those Jews who possess Torah but lack good deeds. The Adasta myrtle has fragrance but no taste, which alludes to those Jews who possess good deeds but no Torah. And the Arava, the willow, which has no taste and no fragrance, represents those Jews that possess neither Torah nor good deeds. Now, Vyakarava states, what does God do with all of them? To destroy them is impossible. So God therefore says, let them be bound together in one bound, and these will atone for those. There's a separate myth on the last day of Sukkot called Hoshana Rabbah. It is called Hoshana Rabbah, the word Rabbah means many or numerous. Since on the day, that day more Hoshana prayers are said than all the previous days. This is the last day of the mitzvah of both the four species, the Lulav and Esri, and the Sukkah. We take five aravos, willow branches, and we bind them together. And at the proper time, we beat them on the ground. Now, the custom of beating them on the ground contains many profound esoteric significance. And only the great rabbis of Israel really merit the knowledge of those secrets. But on a very basic level, we believe that our fate is sealed on Hoshana Rabbah. And so the willow branches allude to the five parts of the soul. We beat them on the ground to symbolize a sort of punishment and a prayer for total and complete forgiveness. What I found most interesting about this mitzvah is that we ask for forgiveness, not through the medium of the esri, which symbolizes the tzaddik, no. We ask for forgiveness through the medium of the arobos, which symbolizes the lowest of the people. In all ways and at all times, the lowest is always the highest in the eyes of God. Total bittles, self-nullification, humility. The esterig is about the size of a fist and represents a human heart. The lulav, straight and long, represents the human spine. The adas is smooth and round and is shaped like an eye. And the arub is elongated and alludes to a person's mouth. The esterig is held by itself in one's left hand. And the other three items are bound together and held in one's right hand. In making the blessing, we bring the esri to the other three species. Now, since the esri represents the heart and the Torah scholar, one would have thought that it would be held in one's right hand, the predominant hand, and that the other three would be brought to it. This is not the case. But why? And of course, there was a great lesson to be learned from this. The Torah scholar should not wait until the people come to him. That would be a sign of arrogance. He should make himself available to the community, interacting with people, going with them and to them to teach them, to help them in their service of Hashem. As I've mentioned before, every sin that we commit blemishes that limb in our body that it's connected to. When one says a blessing over the four species, the Lulav and Esri, and he does so for the sake of God. It is as if he is subjugating his heart and limbs, his power of speech and sight to God above. The Esri, the citron is similar to the heart and atones for evil thoughts, things connected to passion and the enthusiasm that we use when sinning. The Hadas, the myrtle, is similar to one's eyes, it atones for the evil things which the eye seeks, as it states in the third paragraph of the Shema. And you shall not go after your hearts and after your eyes. The arava, the willow, is similar to the shape of one's mouth. The leaves must be smooth. They cannot be serrated. And this atones for those sins that we commit with our lips, using our mouths as weapons to cut people and hurt them. The lula, the palm branch, is similar to one's spine. That is to atone for the sin of arrogance and excessive pride. Our true strength 
comes when we bring all four species together, all types of Jews on all different levels, together. Not because they are the same, no, but because we are all one body, we are all one family. It is our hope and the prayer that after Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that we would be able to enter our sukkah as one family, one nation, one mind. May God help us all to love each other. The Esri, one heart. May we only see the best of each other. The Hadassah, may we speak only about the goodness of each other, and especially God our Father in heaven. The Arava. And may we have the strength of character, the Lulav, to stand tall against the evil and injustice in the world in any form that it may take. Our unity gives us the ability and the responsibility to be what God expected us to be in the world, a light unto the nations. May God help us to fulfill our mission, and with that, usher in the coming of Mashiach Zikainu, quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening, and God bless you all. May you all be blessed with the happy Sukkot in the remaining days a sealing of the judgment, and uh, only know happiness and joy. God bless you all. Thank you very much.